Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You do have discipline. Let's put up 2 Timothy 1:7. God has not given us a spirit of fear. One of the things you do not have to be afraid of is temptation. So many people think, oh, if I just wouldn't be tempted. Well, you're going to be tempted. You're going to be tempted to be lazy. You're going to be tempted to eat wrong. You're going to be tempted to stay up when you should be in bed and be in bed when you should be up. We all have temptation. But we can say no to temptation if we understand the consequences of not saying no. There are consequences. Second Timothy 1:7 says, God did not give us a spirit of timidity, of cowardice, of craving and cringing and fawning fear. God wants us to be bold, confident. He wants us to be full of assurance in Him. But He has given us a spirit of power and love and a calm and, uh-oh, a well-balanced mind. And He's given us what? What? Discipline. discipline. God has already given us discipline. So there's no point in saying, I have no discipline. I can't control myself. Don't ever let that come out of your mouth again. At least if we're not going to discipline ourselves in an area, we just simply need to tell the truth and say, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to. Well, you're not all clapping, but I'll... Like, it's just too hard. I can't. It's just too hard. We are anointed for hard. We are called and anointed and equipped by the Holy Ghost for hard. Do you understand me? That's why we have that extra endowment of power. So we can do hard and still have a smile on our face. And while we're doing hard privately, we can still reach out to other people in their need and say, take that devil, how do you like that? We need to understand that there are consequences for disobeying God. I think sometimes we need a, a little more preaching against sin and a little more preaching about the judgment of God on sin, the consequences of sin in our life. When God says don't do something, He means it. It's not some kind of a holy suggestion, it's a commandment. Do not means do not. <laughs> Amen? And I think sometimes we get away from that. And another thing that concerns me and Dave both is that People no longer have nor understand the reverential fear of God. I'm not talking about being afraid of God in a wrong way. I'm talking about having a reverential fear of disrespecting and dishonoring God. There are consequences. Let's look at Romans 6, 21. Consequences. Do you know that no self-control brings a miserable, messed up life? Romans 6, 21. But then what benefit or return did you get from the things of which you are now ashamed? None, for the end of those things is death. Now let me ask you a question. All the years you lived in sin, before you received Christ, did you get any real benefit from any of that? None. The only thing you got was miserable. Oh, you had a little fleshly thrill every now and then. But the truth is that deep inside where it matters, we were miserable. So did we get any benefit from disobeying God? No, we didn't get any, nor will we get any now. Verse 22, 
But now since you've been set free from sin, hallelujah. Everybody say, I'm free from sin. And have become the slaves of God. I like that. I'm no longer a slave of the devil. You have your present reward in holiness, and its end is eternal life. Do you know that holiness is a reward in itself? You know why? Because there's nothing more wonderful than not feeling guilty and condemned about a bunch of stuff that you're doing that you know you shouldn't be doing, or, or things that you shouldn't be doing, that you are doing, you are doing, that you shouldn't be doing. There's nothing worse than that. So holiness in itself is a reward. Now, next verse, verse 23. For the wages which sin pays is death. But the bountiful free gift of God is eternal life through and in union with Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, death, in that way of talking about there, it doesn't mean that we're going to stop breathing. That's not what it means. It means every kind of misery that you can possibly imagine. Now, you know what? I'm just going to be honest and say, I know that there are people here today and certainly people watching by TV. You may be listening to some recorded version later on. You're miserable. Miserable people still go to church. You know that? I know, because I was one for a long, long time. I could put on my church face and say, praise the Lord, but honey, I was miserable. And miserable people make other people miserable. At least they try to. And part of your misery, I'm just going to be bold and say this, part of your misery is simply a lack of discipline and self-control. There's things you know you should do, but you keep making excuses for it instead of just doing it. And you can sit there and look innocent all you want to. Am I making this section over here nervous? <laughs> I wasn't trying to pick on you on purpose, but now that I see those guilty looks, I'll just... <laughs> well, we gotta let this sink in. Some of you are miserable simply because there's areas in your life where you're, you're doing things that really you wouldn't have to do. It wouldn't be all that hard to change it. It's just going to take a little discipline. So you know you should be spending time with God. Well, it's just, it's just so hard, and I'm just so busy. Busy doing what? Stuff that makes you miserable? Well, you know, I haven't balanced my checkbook in a year. I really have no idea what's going on with my finances, but the bank called and said, I've got checks that are bouncing, and I just don't understand that. See what I can pick on you about. <laughs> Can't find nothing in your house? Got so much stuff piled all over the place. You have no idea where anything's at, so you just go buy another one when you need it. You don't even want me to come up in the balcony, do you? <laughs> now, come on. How many of you agree I'm telling the truth? I'm, I love you. I'm just trying to help you. I'm trying to provoke you this morning. <laughs> there are things that we can't do anything about, but the things that we can do something about, we need to do it. And I'm telling you, 60, 75 percent, maybe even more, Maybe even a higher percentage of all of your problems would be solved if you would just start spending one half hour every day 
God, <laughs> I need you. I heard the sermon, bought the t-shirt, went to the seminar, and I'm still a mess. God, I need you. <laughs> Lord, you got to help me. If you don't change me, God, I'll never change. <laughs> now, Lord, you've told me to stick with this marriage, and I just don't know if I can, God. But I love you, and I want to do what you want me to do. So, God, I'm just going to sit here and wait for you to give me strength. <sighs> what are you laughing at? This is what you need. <laughs> well, I want to spend time with God, but I'm, I'm trying to work God into my schedule. Lord, have mercy. We don't work God into our schedule. We work our whole life around God. Seek ye first the kingdom and His righteousness. Me and I know full well. I mean, some of you are right with me, and you know right where I'm at, and you're like, yay, yay, praise the Lord. But can I tell you, there are probably millions of people watching this television program right now. And you're sweet, you go to church, but you don't even have a clue that you can have an intimate, personal relationship with God through Christ. That you can spend time in His presence, you can talk to Him about anything from how you comb your hair to what to do with your money. And you can wait in His presence and say, God, I'm nothing without you, and you will see unbelievable changes in your life. God has more for us than just for us to go to church and be religious. We want to go to church, but we're not impressing anybody if we don't take it outside of the church and learn how to live the life out there where it really makes a difference. The world needs to see the church fully alive, on fire, committed, dedicated, well-balanced. with discipline and self-control. The amount of talent that is wasted due to a lack of discipline is absolutely pathetic. No horse gets anywhere until it's harnessed. Otherwise, it's just gonna run wild in the field. No Niagara's ever turned into light and power until it's tunneled. No life ever grows great until it is focused, dedicated, and disciplined. I've learned over the years, I put 80% of my time into my top two gifts. Because you can't do everything and do anything well. Some of you have so many unfinished projects laying around that they are just on the verge of giving you some kind of a breakdown. You don't even want to go home because you don't want to look at all your unfinished projects. <laughs> Come on now. You got to focus on something. You got to finish what you start. Give yourself to what you're supposed to be doing. Find out what your gift is and give yourself to it. You have any idea how many opportunities I have to say no to in order to stay focused on what I'm supposed to be doing? My goodness, everybody's busy, we're busy, oh, we're busy. How are you, brother, busy? I haven't heard from you six months, how are you busy? I've been so busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. But are you fruitful? God didn't call us to be busy, He called us to be fruitful. There's a difference. Go home and have a meeting with yourself. Don't you ever have meetings with yourself? I meet with myself all the time. One day I left St. Louis and went off by myself for seven days just to have a meeting with myself. I had a lot of messes. It took a long meeting. It's amazing what God will show you about what's wrong in your life. If you'll get quiet, talk to Him, stop asking a whole bunch of people what you ought to do when they don't even know what they're doing. Come on now. 
The characteristics of a disciplined person. Let's just take a little test. First of all, a disciplined person always goes the extra mile. They do more than is needed to just get by. They always do something extra. They get to work five, ten minutes early. They don't clock in right at the moment. Spend another five minutes in the bathroom, five more minutes in the lunchroom. <laughs> ten more minutes saying good morning to everybody. And then they're going to work at 8.20. But expecting somebody to pay them for all that time they wasted. Well, you're not as happy as you ought to be. <laughs> but I understand it brings conviction. It's like, mm. Now, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to have to leave the house earlier. <laughs> which means I may have to go to bed earlier, and I have to get up earlier. And it's just too hard. <laughs> you know, any person here today will make a commitment between you and God to be the most excellent person that you can possibly be. I dare you to come back here a year from now and try to tell me your life is the same because it won't be. It will be radically changed and greatly improved. Our problem is mediocrity. Matthew 25, 10 virgin, virgins, five foolish, five wise. They were all waiting for the bridegroom to come, which is equivalent to us waiting for the return of Christ. The five that were foolish didn't do anything extra. The five that were wise not only took enough oil to keep their lamps lit, but they took extra oil. Well, guess what? When the bridegroom lingered and it took longer than they thought, then the five foolish, their lamps went out. Can I tell you something? If you don't spend time with God, your lamp's going to go out. You're going to run out of oil. Oil is one of the symbols for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> we don't want to run out of oil. Now, what happened to them is what happens to people. The five foolish, whose lamps went out, went to the five wise and said, give us some of your oil. The do-nothings <laughs> always go to those who do and want them to take care of them. Stop being jealous of what somebody else has got if you don't want to do what they did to get it. Get rid of your wishbone and get some backbone. Well, I wish my house was clean like yours. Well, clean it. I wish I was out of debt. <laughs> well, stop buying stuff and pay your bills off. <laughs> well, I would have to go a long time without buying anything if I did that. <laughs> Dave and I had to do that at one time in our life. When you spend more than you make. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. And when you eat more than your body burns up. <laughs> Woo! Lord, you're thinking, is she just about done? <laughs> you say, now, nah, Joyce, God don't care about how much I sleep and how much I eat. He don't care about that stuff. I got serious problems, honey. But you know what? It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Now, look at me. I want to tell you something. If we're not going to obey God in little things, we're not going to obey God in big things. He that is faithful over little will be made ruler over much. Learn how to obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit.
Be an excellent person. You staying in a hotel room here this weekend? How many of you are staying in a hotel here somewhere? Okay, when you leave, don't trash the hotel room just because somebody else has got to clean it up. I'm not saying you got to go around and make the bed and empty all the trash cans and do the linen, but don't trash the thing. Every time that we leave our hotel room, and we're in hotels a lot, we turn off every light in there. Why? Because I feel like that if I was the owner and manager of that hotel, I would appreciate it. So if we what do unto others as we would have them do unto us, little things. And you know, sometimes we've been around so much mediocrity, and we've lived such a life of mediocrity that we have to be retaught all over again what excellence is. When we first started our ministry 20, I forget how many years ago, it's been a lot. How many years is it, Charlotte? Do you know? 26, 20, 26, I guess. And I was teaching 10 years before that, so I've been teaching the Word a long time. There was three things God put in, in our heart. He said, do everything you do with excellence. If you can't do it right, don't do it. Be a person of integrity. Do what you tell people you're going to do. And keep the strife out of your marriage, out of your home, out of your ministry. And I'll bless you. It wasn't hard stuff. <laughs> And we have really tried to do those things over the years, and you know, we're not doing bad. I think you might say we're having a success. <laughs> Be excellent. When you're out shopping and you knock some clothes off the hanger and they fall on the floor, do you leave them there or do you pick them up and hang them back up? And you even go the extra mile and maybe you see something on the floor you didn't even knock in the floor and you pick it up and put it back. You put your grocery cart back where it goes in the little... How many of you put your grocery cart back now you listen to Mama Joyce? All right. Do you know that it took me two years to get obedient to God to put that stinking grocery cart back? Two years of making excuses. It's too cold, it's too hot, I'm in a hurry. Nobody else does it. And I can tell you the truth, it wasn't so much about the grocery cart, it was that God was teaching me how to be excellent. Come on, I'm talking to somebody. Well, that requires discipline. It requires self-control. Why should I do that? Nobody else does it. Well, that's exactly why you should do it, because nobody else does it. We're the light of the world. <laughs> Come on, turn the bulbs on. Get out in the world and turn the bulbs on. I went to a store and I bought two pair of shoes and a purse, and I had looked at two purses because they matched the two different pairs of shoes and I only ended up getting the two pair of shoes and the one purse. I decided to pass on the other purse. And when I got home, the guy had accidentally packed both purses and didn't charge me for it. So now at my time and my expense, in order to be the excellent person that God wants me to be and a person of integrity, I have to take my time, my gas, and I have to go back and give him back the purse. But what happens? Every time we do what's right, God rewards us. Do you have any idea what people are forfeiting, what they give up, and the misery that's in their life because of all these so-called little things? How many of you can think of a few little things that you might need to attend to? And then lastly, let me say that a disciplined person not only learns how to say no to themselves, they learn how to say no to other people when they need to. Some of you are letting other people drive you crazy. You are so stressed out and overburdened because you have allowed yourself to become a people pleaser 
and you think you need to do everything that everybody wants you to do so they're nice and happy, but in the meantime, you're falling apart. Now, what section shall I pick on? I don't know. <laughs> Up there in the balconies, I see you. Come on, this is all for the balconies. But you guys down here can have it too. You really can't let other people run your life and never have a well-balanced life. You got to discipline yourself to say yes when God is saying yes and no when God is saying no. And if somebody gets mad about it, that's their problem between them and God. You got a life to live. You've got energy. You have gifts. You have creativity. Now you need to start channeling that in the direction that God tells you to channel it in so you can be all that God wants you to be. How many of you think you got a little homework to do when you go home? All right, let's all stand up. Well, you know, we all need to develop balance in our lives. Balance is very important. That means do enough of everything, but not too much of anything. It's 6 a.m. and another sweltering day in Prasat, Cambodia. A number of people have already gathered outside the entrance to the Hand of Hope Health Center, some arriving as early as 5 a.m. For Dr. Yim and his team of doctors and medical staff, it's a typical weekday for treating some of Cambodia's most impoverished for a multitude of health issues that range from injuries, malnutrition, to diseases, it was for this very purpose that the Hand of Hope Hospital and on-site pharmacy opened March of 2009. For Kim Savuth, the Hand of Hope Center was his only hope. After a trek into the mountains to find wood to sell in support of his family, he returned home with symptoms of chills and fever. <laughs> Alarming news for Kim. For him and others in the Prasad area, it's nearly impossible to get medical treatment without the free services of Hand of Hope Health Center. Adverse living conditions are commonplace in the area surrounding Prasad. The Savuth family's level of poverty is so startlingly bleak that they can barely afford the basic necessities to survive. The day we visited Kim, their meal was a rat that Kim's mother cooked on an open fire. You know, I don't think that we can underestimate the power of habits in our lives. First, we form habits, and eventually they form us. In my new book, Making Good Habits, Breaking Bad Habits, you'll discover that the freedom from bad habits lies in filling your life with one good habit after another. And with God's help, I believe you can put an end to struggling with bad habits and discover a new level of success in your life. Get my new book today. In this book vertelt Joyce how it leren van goede gewoonten je leven kan verbeteren. Nu ook verkrijgbaar op DVD en profiteer van de setkorting via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Het computerteam van Joyce Meyer Ministries werkt met man en macht aan onze Nederlandse website. They're faster speed and they're going to have a much better web-based experience. Well, I'm just curious, if we would add a Series 12 flux capacitor, wouldn't we gain as much as a terabyte in data encryption? Wow, that's really out of the box thinking. What's your name? Joyce. That's the kind of stuff that's going to make JoyceMeyer.org a better website. 
Ga naar onze nieuwe site joy-meijer.nl en volg ons op Facebook.